Here we'll learn about common treatments for hypertension, which aim to reduce cardiac output and or total peripheral resistance. For a review of how cardiac output and total peripheral resistance work, please see our tutorial on hypertension pathophysiology. To begin, start a table and denote that lowering blood pressure in hypertensive patients reduces their risk of cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular events. Recent guidelines recommend a target blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. To note that the following lifestyle modifications are typically suggested. Changes in diet, increased physical activity, stress reduction, smoking and alcohol cessation or reduction, and weight loss. Dietary changes to reduce hypertension are encapsulated by the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, the DASH plan, which recommends reductions in sodium and emphasizes whole grains, fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy, fish, poultry, and legumes, nuts, and seeds. In many individuals, however, lifestyle modifications are inadequate or even inappropriate for reducing blood pressure. These patients will need antihypertensive medications. Denote that initial treatment may rely on a single medication depending on the stage of hypertension. However, many patients ultimately require two or more drugs with complementary actions to reach their target blood pressure. Denote that individuals vary in their response to antihypertensive medications and that specific recommendations are made for some populations. For example, African Americans, the elderly, and patients with certain medical conditions may respond differently to an antihypertensive drug than the rest of the population. Lastly, denote that resistant hypertension is when an individual's blood pressure remains elevated above the target goal despite concurrently using three or more antihypertensive medications, including a diuretic. Let's begin our diagram with thiazide and thiazide-like diuretics, which are among the most commonly prescribed antihypertensive drugs. Show that these drugs act on the distal convoluted tubule, the nephron, to prohibit sodium and water reabsorption. Sodium and water are excreted in the urine, so blood volume and blood pressure are reduced. Indicate that these drugs are often a first-line choice, particularly in salt-sensitive individuals, and they are associated with hypokalemia. Write that chronic use causes vasodilation, which also contributes to reduction in blood pressure. What causes this vasodilation to occur is uncertain. Next, let's learn two drugs that block the actions of angiotensin II, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor that also triggers the release of other blood pressure mediators, including aldosterone. First, let's briefly illustrate the renin angiotensin system. Show that the liver releases angiotensinogen. The kidneys release renin, which transforms angiotensinogen to angiotensin I. Then, as angiotensin I circulates in the blood, especially in the pulmonary blood, it encounters angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, which is released from vascular endothelial cells. Angiotensin converting enzyme, as its name suggests, converts angiotensin I to angiotensin II. Show that angiotensin II binds with arterial receptors and induces vasoconstriction. Put this in place, indicate that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, prohibit the formation of angiotensin II by blocking the actions of angiotensin converting enzyme. Write that these are first line drugs and can cause hyperkalemia. Recall that angiotensin II also breaks down bradykinin, which is an important vasodilator. Thus indicate that angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors effectively increase bradykinin levels, which ultimately enhances vasodilation. Show, however, unfortunately, that increased bradykinin is associated with cough and angioedema, which are important side effects of ACE inhibitors. Next, show that angiotensin receptor blockers block the arterial receptors for angiotensin II. Thus, like ACE inhibitors, they prevent angiotensin II from increasing blood pressure. Also like ACE inhibitors, they're associated with hyperkalemia. However, since they don't prohibit the formation of angiotensin II, 
They don't affect bradykinin, so patients don't experience cough or angioedema, making them more tolerable overall. Now let's turn our attention to three blockers that act directly on the heart and or vasculature. First indicate that calcium channel blockers prevent calcium binding. Show that in the heart, receptors are located at the sinoatrial and atrial ventricular nodes, as well as in the cardiac tissue. Thus, calcium channel blockers reduce conduction velocity, contractility, and heart rate. Show that in the vasculature, prevention of calcium binding reduces vasoconstriction. Write that calcium channel blockers are considered a first-line treatment, particularly for African Americans in whom other antihypertensive drugs are often less effective. Calcium channel blockers are associated with swelling in the lower extremities, rash, flushing, and dizziness. Next, indicate that beta blockers prevent norepinephrine and epinephrine binding in the heart, and that third-generation beta blockers also produce vasodilation. Additionally, show that beta blockers block renin and secretion from the kidney, which, as we've illustrated, blocks formation of angiotensin II and elevates bradykinin levels. Common side effects include fatigue, cold hands and feet, depression, sleep disturbances, and erectile dysfunction. Furthermore, some beta blockers can trigger bronchospasm in patients with asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Thus, they're contraindicated in patients with reactive airway disease, or COPD. Finally, indicate that alpha blockers prevent norepinephrine from binding in the vasculature, which reduces vasoconstriction. Show, however, that these can commonly cause orthostatic hypotension, especially in the elderly. This concludes our diagram.